So this is our final lecture, and today we're going to be talking about two different topics, schizophrenia and eating disorders. And compared to some of our other topics, this is going to be a little bit shorter because we don't have a lot of great um, psychological interventions for either of these yet, but I'll kind of discuss what's being done and some of the evidence for that. So in terms of schizophrenia, that probably one approximately 1% 1 of the population will have schizophrenia at some point in their lives. It usually develops late in adolescence and um, and in their early 20s. And so especially with males, we'll see the onset somewhere between 18 and 22, so kind of in that transition from high school to college, and usually a later onset for females compared to males. So with females, you're seeing it kind of in the mid to late 20s. Um, the course of schizophrenia is usually chronic. So once people receive a diagnosis of schizophrenia, they usually have this um, disorder, you know, which can wax and wane for the rest of their lives. Currently, the first and foremost treatment for schizophrenia is a biological treatment because for, you know, I think most of the evidence suggests that schizophrenia really is a biologically based disorder. Um, the genetic evidence suggests that it runs in families. Um, we've done a lot of, you know, brain scans. They've done, you know, neurotransmitter stuff. And we do know that there's a biological component to it. Um, there are different classes of... Um, uh, medications, they're low potency and high potency. Um, the, the low potency are the Thorazine and the Melarol, so those are kind of some of the older school ones. Um, high potency is Haldol, which is more effective at reducing symptoms, but it's also more likely to cause extra pyramidal side effects, so that's kind of like what you've maybe heard of as the Haldol shuffle, where people um, walk kind of, you know, dragging their feet. They also have the, the tongues that stick, stick out of their mouths. Those of you who watch um, the the terrorist show, I always want to call it Home Front, but it's um, with Carrie. Forgive me, I, I have dysnomia. I'm very poor at remembering names. Um, but it's the, the show that's been very popular lately. Anyway, um, once she was medicated, you know, you saw her in the, the psychiatric facility sticking out her tongue. That's an extra pyramidal side effect. Homeland, I believe, is the show. Forgive me. Um, the newer ones um, are the atypicals, like Clozaril, Risperidol, and they are uh, Risperidone. They have a fewer motor side effects, and so you're not seeing these extra pyramidal side effects, and they're very effective at reducing the, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, none of these medications are so good um, at reducing the negative effects. And as with everything, there are limitations of medication. They're not a treat. They're a treatment and not a cure. And so they help, you know, get a person stabilized, but they don't necessarily. They don't get rid of the schizophrenia. That people will always have schizophrenia. About fifty-five percent of people will relapse, meaning that they will return their symptoms um, with if they go off their medications. The meds, as I mentioned, are better at reducing the positive symptoms, but are less effective for those with negative symptoms. About ten percent of people are not helped at all by meds. There are side effects even with the, the newer medications such as, you know, weight gain, lethargy, increased levels of sleepiness, and about 80% of people, whether they're on the medications, um, if they're on medications, will relapse about after about five years. So that's something that's really important to know, and when you're working with clients with schizophrenia, to understand that that's kind of the course of the disorder. That they'll be waxing and waning in terms of the symptom presentation, and that they'll be, you know, different levels of effectiveness to the medications, and you'll often see that people will change medications frequently because one stops working. So some of the side effects of medication, and these are important as a psychologist for you to, to know about if you're working with this population, is that your patients may be experiencing them, and you want to know what's realistic and what might be, you know, some kind of an, uh, a somatosensory um, hallucination, for example. But some of the things that you may see are dry mouth, sedation, blurred vision, constipation, weight gain, the extra pyramidal side effects like slow, awkward motor movement, activities, or tremors. The serious things are the tardif dyskinesia, which are the involuntary movements of the lips, mouth, tongue, and face. These are very hard to um, reverse once you get them, and so about 20% of people will get these, especially with some of the longer antipsychotic medications, and especially people have used them for longer periods of time. So you have to keep in mind that your clients may be dealing with some of these issues, and they're difficult to deal with. I mean, who of us would like to have involuntary lip movements or be, you know, having difficulty with our bowel movements, etc. And so these are very realistic concerns that are associated with the long-term use of these medications. And so you have to be empathetic and help them overcome some of these issues whenever possible. 
So in schizophrenia, CBT is kind of an adjunctive treatment which aims to increase an individual's understanding of psychotic disorders, develop coping strategies for persistent symptoms, and foster self-belief and motivate clients to regulate their own behavior. So we are not seeking to cure schizophrenia with CBT, but what we're helping them do is to, to maintain themselves in the best possible state that they can so they can live as much you know, a, a normal life as possible for them. And much of this is you know, associated with medication maintenance. So the treatment goals of CBT, using again the techniques that we've already discussed, are to reduce the distress and disability caused by the symptoms of schizophrenia. So for example, you know, if they have paranoid delusions, to help them do some reality testing, cognitive distortions, etc. Pros and cons of believing certain things. And you know, oftentimes with schizophrenia, some of these delusions are going to be very strongly entrenched. So even if you can get them to doubt it a little bit so that they don't become kind of overwhelming for them, they can improve the quality of their lives. You want to improve understanding and self-management. So understanding of their disorder. Many times people with schizophrenia don't have insight into their own mental illness. And so helping them acknowledge that they have this illness and understanding the ramifications of it on their lives and that medication is an important part of maintaining you know, a good quality of life, um, and helping them manage themselves in terms of you know, minimizing stress and preventing relapse as much as possible. You also want to improve mood and self-esteem because oftentimes when people have schizophrenia, depression goes along with that. You'll often see people with schizoaffective diagnoses because when people have moments of lucidity, there's often the realization of what has my life become as a result of this disorder, and people become depressed. So it's, it's not an easy um, disorder to have, but again, you know, use with, on medication and with help, people can live relatively good quality lives. You want to keep them as active a participant in treatment as possible. So in terms of coping strategies, you're encouraged to question their thinking. So look by perhaps looking at rational alternatives to paranoid ideation, and I've seen Beck do this with patients with schizophrenia. Um, you know, we once had an individual who was living with his mother and she couldn't leave him at home alone during the day because he wouldn't cook meals for himself because he was convinced that the food was poisonous. So through, you know, what was actually months of therapy, um, he was able to challenge that belief and he put some contingencies in place so that he had specific things that he could use that he believed were not no longer poisonous and he could make himself a sandwich so that his mother could leave him at home during the day and go to work. Um, you also want to teach them perhaps some distraction ten, uh, techniques so that they don't necessarily, um, you know, pay attention so much to hallucinations or just um, or uh, delusions. You also want to have goals to overcome hopelessness, and so you want to give them some short-term goals that are realistic um, and that they can work towards despite their disability. And so you want to guard against unrealistic concerns because that's part of the disorder. Oftentimes, people have very unrealistic goals for their future, but something like you know signing up for a course at a community college and taking that course might be a very realistic kind of goal and give them some meaning to their life or you know finding some sort of employment or things like that. Modification of delusional beliefs which we've already talked about um, and then modifying dysfunctional assumptions so you know um, just by using Socratic questioning question some of these entrenched beliefs that the individual has that are part of their disorder and also their, the fact that they, they may have been told they have certain limitations because of their disorder and so you want to challenge those with Socratic questioning because you know in many cases people with schizophrenia can maintain you know jobs and working with them to help support them through this process. So you want to, in terms of the cognitive therapy, you want to identify, understand, and analyze key cognitions such as these voices are uncontrollable, my illness is uncontrollable, the medication is pointless, schizophrenia means I have a lifetime of illness ahead, and all this mental torture is coming from others and not me. And so you would kind of work on doing basically a diary card, um, might do pros and cons, might do a variety of different techniques. You also want to reduce safety behaviors, which are strategies that are used by the individual, like avoidance. Um, but in other words, but instead actually seek to, you know, um, prevent them from confronting some of their delusional beliefs. So if I, they feel like people are using x-rays to get through their windows, and then they put, you know, tinfoil all over their windows, they are then protecting themselves from being exposed to the x-rays. So if we were having them 
actually be exposed to these x-rays by not having tinfoil on their windows and nothing happened, this would somewhat challenge their belief. Um, it doesn't necessarily always work in a logical way like this with patients with schizophrenia. They may come up with some other delusional explanation for it. But again, slowly you're chipping away at this. And you know, therapy with patients with schizophrenia, it's not like a 12-session you know, endeavor. This is, you know, you may have very minimal gains after working with an individual you know, for a year, but minimal gains might improve quality of life, like having this guy being able to make his sandwich, which took months of treatment, um, you know, improved his quality of life and that he was able to be left um, by himself at home with the mother, the mother could go to work, and so their financial situation was improved. You want to engender self-control and empowerment whenever possible, because oftentimes when somebody gets involved with the system, they lose a lot of that, so you want to give them power and control over certain decisions in your life, which improves their mood. And you want to give them, you know, the, the, the opportunity to find it. There are some things in their thing, life that they can do to help. Um, and it, not everything about their disorder is uncontrollable. You also want to focus on social and family contacts in terms of minimizing the stress and providing a supportive environment. So in controlled trials, CBT has been shown to have some effect in schizophrenia, even in previ people who previously did not respond to medications, and there are no physical side effects, and it's obviously a useful treatment alongside medication therapy. And it might be particularly useful for people who don't comply with their medication regime or for, drug for people who, for whom drugs are not effective. And I think, you know, I think it's a very useful adjunctive treatment. Um, a lot of work in terms of working with individuals with schizophrenia is done in family treatment where families do exist. Um, there's always the hypo there's always that, that theory of the schizophrenogenic mother who causes the schizophrenia in her child, which we obviously know is fake and very harm sorry, fake, very, which is untrue and very harmful. However, we do know that patients with schizophrenia tend to have relapses in stressful situations, and oftentimes it's very difficult for a family to understand schizophrenia, the behavior of the individual with schizophrenia, and you know how that affects the family dynamic. And so family therapy involves factual education about the disease, about medications, the side effects of these medications, um, helping the family identify warning signs of a relapse so that they can get, make sure they can get them to the psychiatrist or hospitalized when necessary. You want a decreased expressed emotion. Expressed emotion is kind of the anger um, and a lot of yelling because we know that that leads to relapse. And we want to increase support for the patient whenever possible. You want to reduce the emotional stress and burden on relatives because we know that caring for somebody in general is very stressful, and especially somebody with a mental illness, because people don't usually understand and the, the person it's very unpredictable. And there's a lot of blame on the person. You know, if somebody has cancer, we you know you can't really blame the person, but with mental illness. We tend to blame the person that they somehow caused this on themselves. So you want to help the relatives with their own ability to anticipate and solve problems for the individual and reduce their anger and guilt by improving communication and problem solving skills. So family therapy has been found to re reduce relapse more than being on meds alone. Um, another thing that we can use is skills training. Also skills training which involves life skills, social skills, and vocational skills. I don't know why this is doing this, so forgive me, but it's an interesting show. So you can do this in group or individual in terms of managing money, organizing and running a home, domestic skills, and personal self-care. Because of the onset of the illness being so young, many times these skills are not developed, or even if they are developed, uh, people through the course of their illness lose these skills, so it's often good to teach individuals who have schizophrenia, some of these techniques can be very helpful. And it's distinct but often paired with social skills training. And so it can either be done by a healthcare professional or nurses or occupational therapists. Social skills training um, is our strategies aimed at enhancing social performance and reducing distress and difficulties experienced by people with schizophrenia. So oftentimes, you know, they lose their friends that they had prior to the onset of schizophrenia, and it's often hard to make new friends, especially friends who don't have severe persistent mental illness. And so you want to build up those you know, skills. So you have to assess where the person is, the severity of their disorder. Some people completely retain their social skills, other people do not. And so you may have to do things like modeling, role play, and social reinforcement. That is Zachary, who is very unhappy that he only has two popsicles instead of three. Um, vocational skills I involve kind of pre-vocational training. Sorry, baby emergency. 
So pre-vocational training is in, um, that which the person is supported in some form of sheltered work before entering the real work employment. And so many times um, a lot of day programs have some sort of sheltered employment whereby you know, there are different expectations and people have the ability to learn in an environment that is supportive and they get paid kind of a minimum wage while they learn. And supported employment attempts to help people in real world employment, so they're actually maintaining competitive jobs, but they have individuals who are helping them and working with them. Usually this is known to the employer, um, sometimes it could be behind the scenes where the employer doesn't know if the person doesn't want to, to reveal that they have a persistent mental illness. So just in terms of outcome, so this is uh, the outcome is the percentage of individuals with a major relapse after two years. So people who just took medication and support or education over 65% over 60 relapse. People who took drugs and so medication, say drugs would mean medication here, and social skills training, there's a 35% relapse rate. And drugs and family stress management, you're looking at closer to 40%. So you can see that doing these types of things really impacts the number of people that are having serious relapse. So it's definitely well worth it because you're improving quality of life for the individual and, and, uh, and the families. Cognitive remediation is actually a kind of a cool thing. Those of you who work with people with traumatic brain injuries may have already done this, but this is basically um, going on the assumption that people with schizophrenia have brain deficits and then retraining some of those areas of the brain can help them with their everyday functioning. It's kind of like those of you who do like Sudoku and those kinds of word mind puzzles in order to keep your mind active is kind of the same theory. So it's a kind of intensive therapy that can help people with schizophrenia cope better with everyday life. Um, it aims the to help the patients improve their cognitive deficits such as difficulty remembering things, poor concentration, or low attention span. And people may have problems making plans or t making decisions, um, correcting mistakes or coming up with new alternatives. And so it's just part of the illness. And so they, the hypothesis is that by learning these types of techniques and using these types of strategies, um, some of these deficits can be overcome or at least minimized. So just to give you an example, I worked in a cognitive remediation program when I was in a intern at a psychiatric hospital, and it would involve things like using computer-based tasks to improve memory, um, using games such as Hangman, doing some stuff like with ADLs, like you know, you're going to a grocery store, this is how much money you have, how much change do you get back, so kind of you know, that here and there, because oftentimes, especially for institutionalized individuals, a lot of those skills, you know, we're not utilized on a daily basis, and we know the brain is a muscle like anything else, and if we're not using it, you know, it kind of goes to mush. So, um, there is mounting evidence that improving patients' ability to learn, remember, and pay attention allows them to better cope with ongoing positive symptoms and, more, and lead more independent lives. As I mentioned, it can be done using computer games. Um, currently, the research doesn't show clinically relevant effects, um, however, we're still working on it. Um, those of you who are looking for internships, um, this is uh, part of the New York State Psycho uh, Psychological, um, uh, sorry, this, the Psych Center, the New York State Psych Center, it's the campus in Rockland, they do a lot of the, the work, the Nathan Klein Center. Again, my dysnomia, forgive me. I need to do some brain um, exercises, I think, since giving birth to three children in five years and lack of sleep that went along with that. I've lost many, many brain cells that I'm working to recover, but I still am lacking, so you'll forgive me. Um, assertive community treatment is otherwise known as ACT. Um, this is where patients are diverted to the care of a community-based multidisciplinary team. So these are patients who are identified as high service utilizers, so they're frequently in and out of emergency departments and inpatient hospitalizations. And it's been determined that it would be more cost beneficial to put them in uh, a more kind of one-on-one -on -one community based service of care. So they're assigned a team, they have low case loads. And then um, members of the team carry very small caseloads, so we're looking at kind of, you know, four to seven cases per individual, which they see frequently in their own homes with 24-hour coverage. So, you know, instead of the individual going out to seek services, which we know doesn't work necessarily that well with people with persistent mental illness, these individuals, these caseworkers, will actually go to their house. Um, 
and you know there's a full range of clientele they serve it's not just individuals with schizophrenia but it's you know people who generally have medical um, mental illness and who are high treatment utilizers and they're often given subsidized apartments um, they can participate in day programming there's a whole host of services offered to them even medical care comes right to their doorstep and they found this to be extremely effective um, in maintaining people in the community and decreasing you know service utilization so it's it's a very um, Effective technique, a randomized controlled trial of assertive community therapy found that people using ACT were more likely to remain in contact with services and less likely to be admitted to hospital than those in standard care. They found that there was a 50% decrease in time spent in the hospital, which is a very significant um, benefit both in terms of cost savings, but more importantly in terms of the quality of life of that individual. So as you can see, just to summarize, um, you know, while we don't have cures for working with patients with schizophrenia just yet as psychologists, many of the things that we can do can significantly improve the course and quality of life for individuals with schizophrenia. So I think it's well worth it to, that our services are very beneficial um, and can make a significant difference in, above, and, above and beyond just taking medication. So now shifting to eating disorders. Um, this is a very challenging, especially when we're talking about anorexia, host of disorders to treat the positive symptoms like obesity, um, where people are overeating or binge eating disorder are easier to treat using our standard psychological techniques. Anorexia, for a host of reasons, is very treatment resistant, and there haven't been a lot of um, evidence-based treatments that have shown significant efficacy um, in working with individuals with the, uh, anorexia. So the first disorder we're going to talk about is obesity, and though it's not a DSM disorder, it's obviously a public health concern. So the overall rate of obesity is 34.8% in the U.S., and the rates have risen significantly and they continue to grow. Um, the rates for men and women surprisingly do not differ, um, as they do with many other things. Um, and generally the rates of obesity increase with age up to the age of 64 and then decline. They're significantly higher among black and Hispanic females than other um, individuals in the population. So one of the re reasons above and beyond kind of the, the concerns of obesity as a psychological issue are the medical complications that go along with obesity because there's increased risk for heart disease and stroke, certain forms of cancer and diabetes. And these are very serious concerns, and while, you know, as we're young, we often don't think about these things, you know, you significantly decrease your life expectancy by, you know, sometimes 20, 30 years because of heart disease and stroke. Um, and diabetes, you know, I've seen, you know, working in an old age retirement home, I've seen people, you know, in their 60s, um, losing limbs, having, you know, knee hip replacement because there's so much wear and tear on their joints. Other um, obesity also contributes to elevated cholesterol, hypertension, and physical inactivity. So cognitive behavioral treatments for obesity again follow very similar models to some of the other disorders that we talk about in terms of self-monitoring. So you want to know what situations people are eating, um, you know, looking at the antecedents, the consequences, the stimulus control. So are there situations um, like specific cues um, that are making people um, eat and therefore we can eliminate those cues. We want to set realistic goals. We want to reinforce gains. We want to educate people about the consequences of obesity. You know, and it's, this is we're not talking about people who, you know, are pleasantly plump and, you know, it, it looks nice on them. Like, we're not saying that everybody needs to be bone thin, but, you know, to be medically, physically obese has many, you know, medical um, outcomes. And they actually now pay, insurance companies actually pay for gastric bypass surgery now because it's cheaper for them to do that than all the consequences of having the patient be overweight. And do cognitive restructuring about beliefs about eating, nutritional education, because in some cases it's just, you know, people not understanding what kind of um, foods they should and shouldn't eat. Working on exercising and preventing, you know, relapse prevention. And again, you want to talk about this similar to when we talk discuss substance use as a journey or a process, and that you know we don't want to abstain necessarily, but kind of eating in moderation, and that should always be the key. You don't want to give up food groups altogether. For example, if people like sweets and they are obese, it doesn't mean they can never eat sweets again, but they can't eat a lot. They have to eat, you know, you know, may, maybe a few bites enough to just get the taste. So. 
There's a lot of um, limitations in terms of research on eating disorders because we don't have our studies last long enough to, for patients to reach their goal weight. You know, because oftentimes we get funding for six months, for a few years, and in you know many cases, if you're if you're thinking people need to lose you know on average one to two pounds a week, if they need to lose hundreds of pounds, this can take you know months or years. There are oftentimes inadequate comparison groups and inadequate follow up as well. So some of the things we know about. Um, Improving long-term weight loss includes better screening, longer programs, incentives for increasing adherence so we can, in our system, our society, increase you know, rewards for people to maintain weight loss, have social support, treatment matching, relapse prevention strategies, and integration of non-behavioral treatments such as you know, mindfulness and things like that. Um, people have introduced things such as mindful eating, so focusing on the here and now, Things as simple as decreasing plate size, <clears throat> because part of how much we eat is the perception of how much we eat. You know, we're taught to eat what's served to us, but now what's being served to us are like oftentimes three and four times what we should be eating, the recommended serving sizes, so understanding what a serving size is. So moving on to anorexia nervosa, there are two types, the restricting and the binge eating purging type. The restricting type is what we're more familiar with. Um, that person doesn't uh, regularly engage in binging or purging, but they do um, restrict their intake of food, so they're eating very few calories a day, if anything at all. Oftentimes they'll eat, drink water, coffee, and maybe eat things such as carrots. The binging purging type can be sometimes mistaken for bulimia, um, but these individuals tend to always be underweight, as people with bulimia tend to be you know, average to above average weight. And they're still restricting, but if they do engage in some kind of a, a binge where they, they actually do consume food, they'll um, engage in purging behavior such as self-induced vomiting, misuse of laxatives, diuretics, or enemas. I don't know if you guys ever watched Beverly Hills 90210, but um, Kelly Taylor, um, the character played by Jen Garth, is a good example of a binge, binging, purging type of anorexic where she would um, you know, exercise for hours on end after eating any kind of food. Um, and so to, to, over, to counteract any food that was going in. Anorexia is the third most common chronic illness in adolescent women. It's estimated to occur in 0.5 to 3% of all teenagers. We're seeing an increase now in the number of males as well because there's increased ma um, pressure in the male community to look a certain way. Also, um, in, the, in the homosexual community, um, the ideal body image is generally thinner, so we're seeing increases in anorexia in, in the gay community as well. It usually first occurs in adolescents with peaks around 13 to 14 years of age, and then again at 17 to 18 years of age. Um, over the past 40 years, the incidence has been steady in teenagers, but it's increased threefold in young adult women. And a lot of people think that that has um, a lot to do with the media and the perception of women in the media. I talked about this in one of my other classes, but you know, as a, a woman who has given birth recently three times, you look in the media and People Magazine and stuff, and they, they highlight the, the movie stars who gave birth two weeks ago and are now back in their bikini, you know, in their bikinis, and so they're making this seem like what the average woman needs to be like. And there's a lot of pressure. The same thing goes, you know, people are retouching magazine covers and everybody, you know, that we don't have a realistic image of what a, a real woman looks like. The average woman in America is actually a size 12, but that's not what the magazines are depicting. They're depicting something that's unrealistic for many people to obtain. So in terms of treatment, the first step in the treatment of anorexia is to aid the client adapt to a more standardized eating pattern. And this often, you know, depending on the, pro the course of the disease, is usually done inpatient. And sometimes this is done via fe force feeding or tube feeding, depending on the client. Some clients will refuse to ingest food, and so they have to be um, hooked up to, you know, a tube and, and fed intravenously. A dietitian may intervene at this point to assist the affected person to adopt more healthy eating behaviors. And the goal is to help the client begin to adopt more normal eating patterns. Now, this is very hard because this is like the greatest fear. Um, what I found with patients with anorexia is they don't respond, especially initially, very well to cognitive therapy because as um, a person goes into starvation mode, your brain isn't working in a logical manner anymore. And it's kind of like when people are just uh, depressed, they only can focus on the negative. 
people who are anorexic can um, are so food focused and everything revolves around food that um, they really can't see anything outside and beyond that so it's only as they start to gain weight um, usually very much against their will and much to their chagrin that they're able to kind of um, engage in psychotherapy and so they may have to be inpatient and gaining weight for a while so this is often done against a person's will um, and usually because they're underage the parents can force this upon them um, as they're inpatient so the goals of the treatment are to treat the medical complications that may have arisen I mean people can die from anorexia because of metabolite imbalances return to normal eating patterns what they find is that people with anorexia never quite return to normal eating patterns, but they do eat. And so while they'll you know, be probably thin and monitoring their food for the rest of their lives, they will maintain you know, uh, a, a sustainable body weight, um, provide guidance on nutrition and exercise, although oftentimes people are hyper aware of um, these issues and they're just very distorted. And so you try to work on the distorted beliefs with CBT, although you know, I feel like it's, it's very challenging and the person has to be ready to work on that. In the initial stages of treatment, people are not there yet and they're not ready to, to make the changes. You want to uh, educate the family about the disorder and help them in terms of providing support to their afflicted family member. And you also want to enhance self-esteem. So um, you want them to be um, more self-monitoring in terms of their eating and binging and um, purging and lack of eating behaviors although you know these individuals are often very hyper focused anyway and many of them already do keep these types of food diaries and journals um, right now there's no conclusive evidence to support the efficacy of CBT so but con in contrast there's not a lot of evidence for anything else um, so aside from you know strapping the person down and force feeding them you do the best that you can um, in trying to kind of heal the individual and working through it. So CBT involves educating about the disorder, um, talking about things such as weight, calorie intake, child changing health status, um, targeting the distorted thoughts, feelings, emotions, and you want to replace negative thoughts with positive ones, problem solving, alternate coping strategies. So again, the, the usual compilation of things that we do in CBT. Um, in a more behavioral fo focused way, um, we find that people who use behavior therapy have increases in weight, eating habits, and body image, um, and these results remain for seven years when the follow up. And most of the patients had improved um, uh, significantly in that seven years. IPT, um, that we talked about the interpersonal theory, actually um, may work better than CBT um, because it's more relationally focused um, and um, talking about losses and changes and stuff like that and so a lot of the self-image stuff can be conceptualized using IPT um, the you know the it's still not dis uh, shown that this is necessarily the most effective strategy yet but it might be something that you would consider if you're working with somebody with anorexia Bulimia nervosa um, is, is when people consume large amounts of food in a small amount of time, generally less than two hours. It's probably before your time, but uh, um, I remember this made-for-TV movie with Meredith Baxter Burney, who was the, the mom on Family Ties, which also may be before your time, so I'm dating myself. But um, she had bulimia, and I remember her going into the fridge and just like shoveling food in her mouth and like just like taking cake and like shoveling it in. And while that might be an extreme, it is not, it's more than kind of having an entire bag of chips or an entire bag of M&Ms or eating, you know, a full pizza or half a cake, which we all do at time to time. Um, but this is really kind of eating very quickly in a small amount of time and having that feeling of being out of control. Um, the prevalence, again, ranges from 2.8 to 5.5% 5.5% of the population. CBT is actually relatively effective for bulimia. Um, again, because it's more of a a positive behavior we can we can decrease its frequency so we want to monitor um, the episodes of binging and purging so that we know what sets the person off because their their episodes of binging and purging are often really are emotionally related it's not necessarily related to food so you want to then expose them um, to those situations and prevent them from engaging in the binging and purging you also will have want to do any kind of stimulus control or environmental change, so things that trigger the individual, making sure that food is not in the house, 
I'm judging food, that is. You want to, um, you want to teach them specific coping strategies to deal with those emotional situations, kind of restructuring, um, counsel them on dietary issues. A lot of people are not aware, and this is why many times people with bulimia are actually overweight, um, that even by binging um, and purging soon afterwards, they're still consuming a significant amount of those calories that the body can absorb. So that's why oftentimes, even though they're doing this, they're, they're not necessarily losing weight. After about 12 months of CBT, 29% had recovered, 48% remitted, um, but there was a high attrition rate, although you can see that the results are, are relatively significant. So moderators of treatment outcome, um, people with lower body weight or BMI have a harder time, people with low self-esteem have a harder time, people who binge more frequently have a harder time, and those who have more personality issues also have a harder time in terms of uh, better outcome. Binge eating disorder, similar to anorexia nervosa, um, is when you have the binges but you don't have the purging. So these individuals are generally overweight when you see them, but they have the, the same um, binging type behaviors. They do it at least twice a week for a period of 60 mo six months. Sorry, and It also causes them marked distress. Um, so the components of CBT for binge eating disorder in involve you know, the rationale for the treatment, monitoring when these binges occur, altering patients' meal consumptions to make them less vulnerable, because sometimes when people are hungry, they tend to purge, and then preventing, uh, doing relapse prevention. A lot of it can be, you know, similar to DBT, using chain analysis of, or binge eating behavior, or binge episodes, diary cards where you're tracking mood and how that relates to the binges, and then you assign homework in between sessions.